In Lecture 9, we began, as I mentioned, the study of what the Bible, the inspired Word of God, actually teaches. And we began with the doctrine of the uh, Trinity. And you will remember I closed that lecture with the reference to the great commission of our Lord to His apostles in which He commanded them to make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so that the Trinitarian confession was necessary to becoming a Christian, receiving baptism as an outward sign of being a Christian, so that it met a good deal of instruction in the Word of God before these disciples were made. They weren't just given a slapdash treatment. They were told that you cannot teach the doctrine of the Trinity without giving careful attention to its meaning, having considerable knowledge about God as such and about the distinct personalities in the Godhead and their particular roles in redemption and so on. So you realize that the commission of Jesus Christ to His church was to make disciples but to make them carefully on the basis of a very credible profession of the Trinity. And then as the commission went on, Christ said, teach them who are baptized in the name of the Trinity to teach them whatsoever I have commanded you. And Christ has commanded that the Bible is the Word of God to be respected as such and to be taught in its fullness except as things like animal sacrifices have been fulfilled and done away with and so on. And I mentioned that that was a very comprehensive commandment to teach everything which He Himself commanded in His Holy Word. And it was on the basis of that and that alone, you'll remember, that our Lord promised to be with the church to the end of the age, so that if any church ceased to be Trinitarian, Christ was not with it. And if any church which, being Trinitarian, nevertheless neglected to teach the whole counsel of God, it could not hope for Christ's presence with it to the end of the age, but only those who do. So now we are looking at what the church is supposed to be teaching uh, from the Bible for the baptized members of the Christian community. And we start with the doctrine of decrees. Let me read it before I comment further. One, among the difficulties of interpreting the Bible, one of the greatest stones of stumbling is the decrees of God. Psalm 2, 7, 8, 3, Daniel 4, 20, Acts 13, 4, 1 Corinthians 2, 4, Jude 4. These are all passages which indicate that God has determined everything which is to come to pass. That last passage, which I should take time to read perhaps, uh, just say here, indicates that even wickedness was decreed, that these persons who crept in unawares in the church of Jude were people who had been appointed to that condemnation. They were working out the decrees of God even when they were violating the commands of God, so that the decrees are comprehensive. Number two, according to the Bible, everything is cut and dried. <laughs> I hate to use that expression, but that's the way people speak, an eternity before it began to be. Three, you can see the Bible was not made in the USA. It came from the land of Islam and Kismet. Four, but what Islam and Kismet forget is that though all is cut and dried, it is all full of life and change. Five, that's the thing about the decrees. They are fixed, but change in all around I see, which is the result of all the fixity. It's fixed change. Six, if anyone thinks the cut and dried makes man a stock and block, he has a few thousand things coming. Seven, God fixedly decreed life, activity, choice, responsibility, blessings and cursings, heaven and hell. Eight, you are as free as if nothing were fixed, and everything is as fixed as if you were not free. Nine, this gives man full scope for the entrepreneur 
and the security of an e-bond. 10. The best of both worlds. The world of God, who knows all things from the beginning, and of man, who knows nothing in the beginning. Let me say with respect to these, uh, this first item that the decrees constitute a great uh, stumbling block for many people. Some of you may have heard me tell because it's the most uh, poignant experience I've ever had with this verity in my life. It occurred a good 30 or 40 years ago at New Wilmington Missionary Conference in uh, Western Pennsylvania. I had been preaching, not on predestination either, and one of the co-eds at the conference asked me at the end of the message whether she understood Christianity correctly as saying that God has determined everything that comes to pass. And she gave me a little mini lecture of about five minutes on the decrees, which was positively professional. She understood it exactly as I believed the Bible taught it. But she wanted to check with a professional, as it were, a person much older than she, who ought to have known this even better than she, that very competent young lady knew it. She said, is this right, Dr. Gershner? Is this what you understand the Bible to say? Yes, I said. That's exactly what I understand the Bible to teach. She said at that point, I was never so close to not being a Christian. I said to her, you were never so close to being a Christian. Now, you see, it wouldn't have a conversation like that with the average church member. Not many church members were as knowledgeable as that young lady, but she understood the Bible the way it's supposed to be taught from every Christian pulpit in the world. She understood it very clearly, and precisely because she did understand it, she felt she was quite unable to accept it. And therefore, she said to me, I was never so close to not being a Christian. And you realize why I said to her, you were never so close to being a Christian, meaning, my young friend, if you don't accept it, you can't be a Christian. This is the revelation of God. There are many Christians who don't know it, don't understand it, but you're not among them. You do understand it. And you're wondering whether you can accept it. And I'm saying to you, you better accept it. Sincerely from the heart. You can't possibly be a Christian. I, tell, I didn't tell her, but not very far away in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, some other time where I had been asked to speak on the decrees of God for some four Wednesday evenings, a little old lady said at the very first meeting, Dr. Gerstner, I want you to know I don't believe in election because I don't think it's taught in the Bible. And I said to the lady, you ought not to believe in election if you don't think it's taught in the Bible. You ought not to hold as true something which you think God has not revealed as true. I commend your attitude. I don't agree with your judgment. And the pastor's brought me here to try to persuade you otherwise but don't you ever believe in a doctrine if you don't think the Word of God teaches us. Well, she was there for all meetings. She participated to a degree and was right with the subject all the time. And the last night, as the series was coming to a close, the little old lady stood up and said, Dr. Gerstner, you've convinced me that the Bible teaches that doctrine, but I still don't believe it. That's a different woman. She's a lost soul. You can't tell God you don't believe it. You can tell Gersley you don't believe that. There's no risk in that. But this woman was telling God she didn't believe it. She was saying, I know that's what God says, but I don't believe it. 
That's the same as saying I'm not a Christian. You're asking for your own damnation. Now that young girl, 10 miles away on another occasion, she understood exactly from the very beginning and saying she was never so close to not being a Christian. This little old lady didn't realize she was far than close to not being a Christian. She was not being a Christian if that was a true statement of her heart. That's how important this doctrine is, even though probably more than any other, or at least as much as any other doctrine in the Bible, it causes difficulty. Not just with that old lady and that young lady and men of all ages too, but with most Christian people. Two, according to the Bible, everything is cut and dried and eternity before it began to be. As I say, I recoil myself from that expression, cut and dried. And you'll notice I put it in quotes there because it's just the way it's often stated. And it's a pejorative term, the way it's stated. But nevertheless, it is true. Things are absolutely certain. It may be wise for me at this particular juncture when we're talking about the creeds, the, the, the decrees, for people to realize that if they only believe in foreknowledge and not decrees, foreknowledge just says that God knows from all eternity all that's going to happen. Decrees affirms that he has determined what is to happen and that's the reason he knows from all eternity what's going to happen. I'm just reminding people who think they have trouble with the decrees because of this cut and dried, this fixity feature that is indisputably a part of it, they have the same problem with foreknowledge. See, for every, uh, shall, what I say, uh, for every, uh, well, I don't know how to give the figure. What, I, what I'm thinking of right now is the vast majority of people who have trouble in this area have it with the decrees. Hardly anybody, some, but very perceptive, rare exceptions, have problems with foreknowledge. They can't live with decrees. I'm never so close to not being a Christian, see. But this, they seem to take in their stride. And I'm just reminding you, this assures the fixity every, much as, every bit as much as this does. If God foreknows that I'm going to be here making this videotape with Jack Rowley in Orlando, it's absolutely certain Jack is going to be here and I'm going to be here and I'm going to be saying to you exactly what I'm saying right now from all eternity if the decrees are true. But it is just as certain if there were no decrees and foreknowledge was a fact. If God knew from all eternity that we would be making these tapes here, there is no possibility. Jack would have decided not to make them, and I would have decided not to video them. No possibility at all. It's a fixity. This doesn't make it that way, theoretically, but the fact is it proves it. So anybody who has trouble with this because things are certain in advance, We'll have exactly the same kind of problem here. You ought to be aware of that. No, I bring this into focus on this subject because this is the subject at which that particular sensitivity arises when it ought to arise here just as well. If you have problems with this for fixity, you have problems with that. If this has to go out, if you're going to have to stand up and say, I can't believe in the decrees, and so on, you're going to have to stand up and say, I don't believe in foreknowledge. Number three, you could see the Bible was not made in the USA. It came from the land of Islam and Kismet. You realize what I'm driving at by that. We are a get-up-and-go people. We are known for our activism. We are not profound thinkers. We aren't great meditators. We are pragmatists by nature. We tend to be a realistic, activistic type of uh, people. But this type of thing, you see, wouldn't be made in the USA. This isn't the sort of thing we naturally incline to. We adopt it as we become Christians, but it's not a sort of native mindset that you find far, far more characteristic of the near and the far east than you do 
of the West. Four, but what Islam and kismet forget is that though all is cut and dried, it is all full of life and change. Well, of course, the, the Muslims, I may say, they have the same theological stratifications that we do. All religions do. Hinduism does, and so does Confucianism. They all do have certain uh, ways of thinking. They have different nomenclature, different patterns of thought, and all the rest of it, but certain channels in which the mind uh, goes. And uh, uh, I'm saying here that uh, that tendency to make God all sovereign, you see, is in some uh, minds, and the tendency to make man's freedom upset that sovereignty is in other minds. And I'm saying at this particular moment, though the dominant motif with which Islam is known is the Asherite theology or that orthodox, uh, almost fatalistic predestinarianism of uh, Islam. But they have their objectors. They're the Merjaites and other people who are people who are in the interests of responsible human freedom tending to fight against that Islam, that uh, decree that will of God and the kismet submission to it idea. Now, in any one of these traditions, you have them, but the fundamental idea in Islam and in other Eastern religions tends to be that way, whereas a fundamental tendency in the American culture is to be interested in that human activism uh, more. But the, as I say, the, the Muslims... Uh, uh, they have their fun with this, too. You hear the stories all around the place in Egypt and elsewhere about the thief who was caught robbing his master and was excusing himself on the ground that it was decreed, whereupon the master gave him a thorough thrashing, accus uh, justifying himself on the ground that that thrashing was also decreed. They have their fun with it and so on, but the, the concept is more native uh, to them. Five. That's the thing about the decrees. They are fixed, but change and all around I see, which is a result of all the fixity. Fixed chain. If anyone thinks the cut and dried makes a man a stock in the block, he has a few thousand thinks coming. I just finished a series of ten lectures on predestination at Geneva College. And I said at the very outset, and I said it again, at the end of the lectures, the fundamental problem with predestination is definitional. People don't even understand what it means. And obviously, uh, if you're objecting to something which it is not, you're not objecting to predestination. But predestination is God's decreeing the free acts of responsible beings. See, the decreeing is of free acts. That's the very meaning of the word. Now, as people tend to think that predestination is a decreeing of the acts of men, which therefore can't be free. But as Westminster says, he decrees in such a way as to do no violence to the will of the creature. The will of the creature remains intact. It's a profound mystery. But a mystery, not a contradiction once again. God decrees that I'll be here making this videotape. I choose to come here to make this videotape. They're both a part of it. I'm fully aware of the fact that I've chosen to come to Orlando for this purpose. And I'm equally fully aware of the fact that God has chosen to have me come to Orlando for this particular purpose. What's the problem? Right now, I'm just dealing with the definition. The definition of predestination or the decrees which are more comprehensive than predestination, but this is the area where most of the objections raised, is the fact that God decrees free acts. Now, anybody on the ground of freedom has no real basis for objecting to the decrees. He's really objecting to fatalism. He's confusing predestination with fatalism. Fate is something that's decreed regardless of your feelings, regardless of your choices. 
even sometimes quite contrary to your choices. That great story of Oedipus Rex, you see. Oedipus kills his father not knowing he's killing his father. He marries his mother not knowing the woman is his mother. But he damned. His act mean nothing. He was not a patricide. He was not an incestuous person. But according to this fatalistic motif in that particular drama, that made no difference. And the story is a profound tragedy. But you see, predestination does not infringe with the free acts of men. And those are the responsible acts of men. And in a true doctrine of predestination, Oedipus would never be predestined to be damned as a patricide and an incestuous individual. Never. And pre he would have done his acts just as his acts, just as I do my taping here as my act. And the act is either good, bad, or indifferent, depending upon my will and Oedipus's will. God's decree does not change any of that. Granted, it's mysterious. But who is there to say that it cannot be? Maybe I better take a little more time on this uh, particular point of seeming discrepancy here. This seems to eat up all we've been saying here about the fact that the Bible doesn't contradict itself. And there are people who go into the mat with me time and again about the fact that you can't have predestination and decrees and also freedom. So one time at a youth conference in Wisconsin, we had about 700 young high school students there, and a number of them wanted to talk about predestination with me. And I said, all right, two hours at least and you come and you stay. Nobody comes in between and no one leaves unless he has to, and so on. And that was right in the middle of the afternoon when they had all their fun, swimming, volleyball, and all the rest of it. A couple hundred students came. They sat in that room, and for two hours we discussed this matter of sovereignty and freedom. First of all, I had them write, give me anything they can think of in Scripture which indicated God was sovereign. They did a good job on it established it thoroughly, and I had asked them to do the same thing with respect to the freedom of man, and they did the same thing. The evidence was overwhelming. There was one young fellow who was sitting through all of this, who at every juncture that he had an opportunity, almost every 10 minutes, he would raise the question, how can they be? I'd say, wait a minute now, let's find out whether they are, first of all, the that before the how, and so on. And it was a good hour and a half before all this was done, and it was established to everybody's satisfaction because those young people believe the Bible was the Word of God. And they recognize what we've been saying here. If it's the Word of God, whatever it says is absolutely inherently true. So, God is sovereign, man is free. That is a fact. That is a truth. And then finally, the young man asked for the last time, all right, how is it? How can it be? And when I said, I don't know, he was just about ready to clobber me. He'd been waiting for two hours for to get an answer to that particular question. But as I said to him, it's a very complex question of how these things mesh together. And suppose I and suppose other people aren't able to draw you a map, a diagram of the precise way in which an eternal decree merges with a decision of a human creature in time. Does that in any way militate against what you've already established here by divine revelation that it happens? Well, he finally was prepared to admit that particular fact. I have never seen any argument which said these cannot both be true. And as a matter of fact, I think you realize if any of you are resolving at this point to find an argument that that would itself be blasphemy if God has. What you would have to do before you work on this is to prove we made a slip someplace else here and that the Bible doesn't teach both of these. If the Bible does teach both of these and it is the Word of God, you know it's true. And while you may be interested in writing the volume that has never yet been written, explaining exactly how it happened, may God bless you in it. 
But if you ever tried to, uh, your explorations in this area to disprove that, God's curses are upon you if that is his truth. As I say, the thing for you to do is to try to prove that that is not the case, then do the other. But if it's the case, then this is just for further information. No theologian has ever given us any very satisfactory explanation of that, which is no problem. A number of things can be beyond us without being against us. I think I've been covering a number of these uh, as, uh, as I go. The, uh, let's look at number seven a second. God fixedly decreed life, activity, choice, responsibility, blessings and cursings, heaven and hell. Notice the curses as well, you see. But uh, curses are harder to uh, digest than the blessings. But you see, if the decrees do no violence to the will of the creature, if he's in full possession of his choices, then, of course, if a person makes the right choices, the good choices, that brings blessing. And if, on the other hand, he makes the wrong and evil choices, that's going to bring cursing from God. If God's predestination forced him to do evil and bring curses on him for something he couldn't help doing, then, of course, he's not only free of guilt, but God is guilty of crime. God pushes a person into something and then damns him for something God pushes him into. If that were the case, it's not only that he would be innocent, but God would be profoundly guilty. But that is not what predestination means. God doesn't push anybody into sin. God just lets him go into sin. But he doesn't induce anybody to go into sin. He doesn't tempt anybody to do any sin. And he's utterly incapable of doing any sin himself. And number eight here, just a word on that. You are as free as if nothing were fixed and everything is as fixed as if you were not free. Now, see what I mean by that. Uh, <laughs> I had to say this briefly here. But uh, when people have trouble with the decrees because they think it infringes on their freedom and they want to be absolutely operating in an undetermined universe, they wouldn't be any freer than they are now. If there wasn't a decree that ever happened, if there wasn't anything that was ever determined, and they had the freedom that they desire, that wouldn't be one whit greater than the freedom they now have in a fixed universe because of the fact that God has decreed things in such a way that you do your thing. And if it is an evil thing, you're going to be punished for it because it is your evil thing. He didn't do it. He decreed it, but he didn't do it. You did do it, and the wages of sin is death. You come to Christ and are in Christ and so on. It's your doing. He's brought you around by conversion to it, but nevertheless, it's your doing. And you will have all that belongs to those who are in Christ, which is, praise his name, nothing less than everlasting salvation.